Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, can you hear me? Can someone type? Uh, can you guys uh, hear me? Okay, thanks, Jake. Um, okay, good. So uh, welcome everyone. This is um, um, lecture or webinar uh, number eight in the uh, Stark at Home series. Um, and I, I earlier had some internet problems here. So if I suddenly disappear and turn into a snail, I will try to uh, you know, turn back to my uh, human form as quickly as possible. But uh, I hope it doesn't happen again. Anyways, today we have a very um, special um, uh, kind of format uh, in particular. So for those who attended previous lectures, all previous lectures had uh, basically only me doing all of the talking. And today, and I think this will be a format that we'll try to adopt looking forward, um, I feel confident enough uh, with the technology to actually uh, experiment even further. And uh, we'll have several um, guest uh, speakers come on and, and share some thoughts on the topic matter. Uh, one of them just, uh, you know, was asked and, and announced. Uh, that's uh, Joe Bono, who's uh, one of the co-authors of the VDF paper. Um, so the topic for today is um, the topic of using cryptography to uh, halt uh, time. Um, so sort of playing, uh, you know, stopping time using cryptography. And this is a pretty old concept, and it goes back, uh, you know, to the 90s and even earlier than that. Um, the, the reason we're talking about it on the Stark at Home series is because um, there is a way to use... Um, Starks and also other uh, succinct proof systems, SNARKs or, or other you know versions of ZKPs in order to uh, achieve this uh, sort of functionality um, that we'll discuss. So the plan for today is I'll talk just a little bit about uh, the general setting of you know halting time with uh, cryptography. Um, I'll ask. Uh, uh, Joel Bono to say a few words about um, VDFs. Um, I'll ask uh, Justin Drake from the Ethereum Foundation, who's, I think, leading the VDF Alliance effort to say a few more words on the usage of VDFs on layer one. And then remember, this is about, uh, you know, the Stark at Home series. So, so we want to connect it to... Uh, you know, starts because VDFs and, and time locks are not something that naturally involve uh, a proof system. And then we want to do a, a deeper dive into how we plan to use um, Starks uh, in order to get some form of a dual functionality for a time lock and a VDF. And then we'll be done with the sort of, uh, you know, formal part of, of the talk, you know, the math and the engineering challenges. Um, those who want to stay and hear a little bit more, um, I also asked uh, Kineret and Tom, who work with me at Starkware, to say at the very end, and you know, after we're done with the math and everything, to say a few words about uh, the um, VDF uh, proof of concept that will actually be running as a service uh, layer two on Ethereum. Again, for those who are interested in the more practical details. Um, so. Without further ado, I just want to share, first of all, uh, a screen and then start uh, typing as I usually do. And um, you're more than welcome. If you look at the bottom, there's the ask a, ask a question uh, uh, part. So please use it. And um, from time to time, I'll go back and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, look for questions and so on. So I will now share a screen. Good. Sorry, and now, yeah, okay, cool. So, um, we want to talk about um, let's just use some cool color. 
So I want to talk about uh, two different things. One of them is uh, uh, time lock. And this goes back, to best of my knowledge, to a paper by uh, Shamir, Rivest, and Wagner from 96. And then I want to talk also about verifiable delay functions or VDFs um, functions. And this is a newer paper that actually is from, uh, so Justin pointed out that this is from, uh, you know, uh, June 18, 18. So it's like two, wait, June, we're now, uh, sorry, June 12. It's from actually June 12, 18. So exactly uh, two years ago that it was first posted. Good. So, um, and, and so first I want to describe what are these things. And then we'll let others talk and, you know, praise the many benefits of these things, mostly VDFs. And then I want to tell you about how um, algebra and, and uh, proof systems in per particular Starks can be brought to uh, help with this thing. So the time lock, um, was this idea that you want to, you know, you have this, uh, this is time, right? Um, and here you have uh, time zero, and, you know, here there's some time t, so this is like now, and this would be, you know, later. And we would like uh, some secret to be put in an envelope now, so that uh, when you reach this point in time, you can uh, open the envelope and everyone can see what's in it. And this is very useful for all kinds of things like, uh, uh, you know, deposit uh, rental, your uh, your uh, deposit, sorry, your uh, your rent checks and things like that. Another thing that it is very useful for is for a sealed uh, bid auction, right? So everyone wants to put in their bids, and after some time, everyone opens their bids and uh, you know who the winner is. Um, and we have a lot of ways to get these things done, and most of them involve some form of uh, one of the two, either interaction and or some trusted party. So for instance, if you look at the sealed bid auction, what we do is uh, there's someone guarding this big box and everyone puts their bids inside an envelope and we trust that that entity to guard the envelopes until the uh, bidding phase has ended. Okay, so there's trust there. Another way to achieve this using the cryptography would be to do some interactive mechanism where you do like a commit reveal scheme. So everyone hatches with some salt their bids, and then when you reach the opening phase, everyone is asked to uh, open their hashes and reveal their bids, and then there's interaction, and you have this problem that maybe people won't uh, necessarily, you know, they will sort of opt out when they see the other envelopes opened. Um, and what uh, Shamir Rivest and Wagner uh, proposed in 96 was a different scheme, very beautiful, based on um, repeated squaring Uh, modulo some RSA prime n. And the idea is that uh, um, there's a way for you to, um, you know, if you know what the secret is, you can figure out uh, some integer k so that uh, if someone raises, and you can find out some, so, so given a secret s, you can compute from it, um, well, let's put it this way, sorry. I want to say is that um, if you know if you know first of all the factoring if you know the factoring p times q that equals the RSA integer and you have your secret s you can find efficiently some uh, um, r and k sorry r and k such that um, if you take R and raise it to power two to the K mod N, that will equal S. So let's just stare at this. You wanna hide your secret S so for a certain period of time. So what you do is you find efficiently uh, some starting point R 
and some integer k. That's sort of the number of repetitions of, of this process. And you publish r and k. And everyone is, and what happens is that if you take r and you repeatedly square it and always take the remainder modulo n, after k iterations of this loop of repeated squaring, you will end up with the secret s. So this was the uh, main contribution of that paper. It basically gives a way to hide a secret for a period of time. They said, you know, if you want to do this mechanism, you're going to sort of create an RSA integer. You're going to, uh, you know, sample pretty large P and Q. And then once you have your secret S, you can, uh, because you know the factoring of P and Q, you're going to find uh, the starting point R. And uh, depending on the time you want to lock it for, you're going to pick what K will be. And then you'll tell the, you'll publish R and K, and you're assured that uh, R to the power two to the K will equal the secret uh, after the time that you cared about. So this is a time lock mechanism. And by the way, there, there, there was a lot of work about it. And uh, also it, it appears on the news from time to time, I think roughly half a year ago, um, one of the time locks that uh, I think Revest uh, post a long time ago was, was broken by exactly sort of uh, doing this process bringing it more efficiently on modern day, on modern day computers. So it, it hit the news. Okay, fast forward to the verifiable delay function. And I'll speak very briefly about this because there are bigger experts on it. And I will let them say a few words uh, soon. So um, one way to think of what happens, let's say, with Bitcoin, uh, uh, the whole proof of work thing. I mean, it serves many, many purposes. But one of the purposes that it serves is to have this sort of... Uh, 10 minute, uh, you know, delay uh, during which uh, a new block is created and uh, then 10 minutes go by and another block is created. And this, this is via a process. So there's some periodic randomness appearing at a, at a rate of roughly 10 minutes. And it's very useful for a lot of properties. This is the, the way that new coins are distributed among the different uh, uh, miners and so on and so forth. But Famously, it also has a huge problem, which is that uh, it creates this sort of arms race that, that it leads to spending a lot of electricity, which, which is bad. Um, so one of the ways to fight that is to get some, you know, trusted uh, source of randomness that would give you spit out uh, some randomness that no one can predict at a, let's say, at a, at a constant rate of, let's say, once per 10 minutes. And um, the image that comes here to mind is one of a roulette wheel spinning. So if you think about a roulette wheel, it is something that, you know, you, you, you walk into a casino and someone is spinning their roulette wheel. So everyone knows that the laws of physics will determine the outcome of the roulette. But because the assumption is that the people around the roulette wheel don't have any ability to uh, predict uh, where the ball will end up, um, even though it's a deterministic physical process. And because of that, uh, this is fair randomness. So you have fair delayed, um, you know, randomness. For, so so it's, it's deterministic. The outcome is determined by the laws of physics. But from the point of view of the people standing next to the roulette, you, you don't really, you know, you treat this as fair randomness. So a verifiable delay function is something that achieves a similar uh, goal via a deterministic, highly sequential uh, process, okay? So the idea is, for instance, uh, simplifying it, what if we took the latest block hash, and then in order to uh, decide who is the miner that will win, you know, or earn or get to mine the next block, what if instead of having all the miners in the world competing and, and you know, finding a certain hash that, that has enough zeros, what if we just sent it into uh, this very sequential function that no one can predict its outcome before less than 10 minutes transpire, but after 10 minutes, everyone will agree that this is the correct output. Then you can start thinking about ways to replace proof of work with this mechanism. So the VDF uh, paper, a very influential one by uh, Bono, Bonnet, Bunz, and Ben Fish. So it's really you know three Bs and another B uh, was published two years ago, 
and indeed uh, because of its impact on on potential impact on proof of stake mechanisms um it was uh it's it's deeply researched and there's a, a lot of work around it and you can see that there's some similarity with the time lock right because in both cases you want something that uh, you know starts now there's an output that comes out 10 minutes or one hour later but I mean, no one knows what it is before um the difference between time lock and the vdf is that in a time lock the uh, locker uh, wants to make sure that the output is something very specific like s in this example and in the vdf you want to take you you know you want to spin the wheel so you want to take something that is not completely deterministic but then run the video give that as a v, as an input and you want no one in the world uh, to know anything about the output until the time has transpired so this is a very brief uh, discussion of uh, you know these two functionalities um, again looking ahead so I'm now going to pause for some questions and then invite uh, first uh, Joe Bono to say a few words and then uh, Justin um, and um, and then I want to describe a very, very specific Stark-based uh, VDF because uh, what I said here till now has no relation to uh, zero-knowledge proofs or Starks or algebra. Okay, so I will now go back and just ask, see if there are any questions here. Um, okay. So I will now, I see there are no questions, which is good. Um, so I will now uh, invite, and then again, this is the first time I'm trying to do this. I will first invite um, Joe. And you know what, I'll already invite also, uh, I'll try to invite both Joe. Uh, and uh, Justin onto the screen. And... Uh, very exciting. It's the first time I, uh, oops. And then uh, we'll go back to, uh, good. So there's Joe. He's not in his pajamas. Uh, let's see now. How do I, so I'm going to enlarge. Okay, Joe, please. Uh, can you enlighten us about uh, context for VDFs? So sure. let's say five uh, minutes and then answer questions and then we'll have uh, Justin speaking. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, great to be here and see you continue to work here. Um, yeah, I guess that if idea came from and how I got involved. Uh, I think in 2015, I wrote, uh, I wrote a paper that it just ended up uh, going to it actually got a few conference rejections and it went to the big conference in the sky, uh, AKA ePrint. Um, and the paper was about, uh, it was about using Bitcoin as a randomness source, as a random beacon, which we'd seen a lot of people were doing in practice. There were a couple of papers that mentioned if you need a trustworthy source of public randomness, you can just take Bitcoin blocks. Uh, so we tried to write a paper analyzing this. Um, the paper's analysis sort of ran aground on the fact that uh, there were sort of like really cheap, low-cost ways to try to bias the randomness. Um, in particular, there's a case where like two blocks get found at the same moment in time on the Bitcoin network. And if you're an attacker, you can potentially uh, bribe other miners to favor one block or another based on which one gives randomness that you prefer. Uh, so, you know, we were sort of left at the point of saying, well, ideally we would have some delay that gets added where you can't immediately tell when a block is found uh, if it produces the outcome you want or not, right? So if the simplest case is like there's some sort of lottery, you either win or you don't. Um, if the computation given a block of whether or not uh, you win the lottery takes a long time, then uh, you could thwart this attack because you wouldn't, uh, at the time the block is found, you wouldn't know whether it's favorable or not. So you wouldn't know whether to attack. Uh, and if the delay is long enough, then by the time you have your answer, it's we assume it's too late to attack. The network has reached consensus on one block or the other, and you're sort of stuck. Uh, so we sort of identified that in 
2015 and said having a delay function would be great. It would sort of make blockchains a, a great way to, to do public randomness. Um, but we looked around. Uh, I, Jeremy Clark, who I wrote that paper with, said he, he thought it was impossible to have uh, an inherently sequential problem um, that with an efficient way to check if the answer was correct. So we abandoned the idea a little bit. Um, I think I wrote a follow-up paper that just talked about delay functions, so without the verifiable part, uh, where you would uh, try to verify that like a long sequence of hash computations. So I, I mean, I should say, if you only want a delay function, uh, it's very easy. Everybody knows how to build one. You just take a hash function and iterate it, and we're all fairly convinced that there's no real way to accelerate that. Um, at least you can't accelerate it with parallelism or any other sort of scalable way. You can always buy faster hardware. That's sort of a caveat over every VDF talk. Um, so yeah, so you know, we, we had that idea of you could have this delay function and we wrote a paper about sort of using some economic protocol where uh, people publish the results and if, people, if other people can prove that there was a mistake in their computation uh, they get a reward, so there was, you know, it wasn't actually a proof that it was correct, but there was an incentive system for people to catch correctness. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I basically kept thinking about this for a couple years. I went to Stanford to do a postdoc and got, uh, you know, the Stanford uh, co-authors of the VDF paper interested. Um, and I, the idea was very much in the air, so there was a, a paper by... Uh, Wesolowski and Lenstra, the sloth paper, which, you know, proposed something that's very VDF-like, but not called a VDF, not with exactly the same properties. Of course, Ben Wesolowski was also working on his, you know, VDF implementation parallel to us. Um, so, yeah, it's been a really exciting two years. Uh, the, I can, I can say my, the main thing I personally contributed was the name. So, I think about uh, three years ago, Ellie had me, uh, it, was, it was great. I got to go visit Ellie in, uh, in Israel at Technion and give a talk. And that was before we had the name VDF. So I was sort of trying to describe this thing uh, abstractly. And um, yeah, it was, it was very nebulous at the time. Uh, and Dan Bonet said, you know, this thing really needs a good name. Um, so uh, yeah, so we, we went through a bunch of iterations and finally said, look, uh, this VDF name is perfect because once you understand the three components, you know, the V, the D, and the F, you know exactly what you're trying to build. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's sort of the story of how it came to be. And I'm sure Justin can uh, give more of an update of uh, everything that's happened since then. And, of course, the effort to, to make it real with hardware. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really fun to watch this uh, progress from a missing, basically a missing piece in a paper five years ago to now a thing with uh, dozens of researchers looking at it and, and real money involved. So, uh, yeah, long live VDFs. So well, we'll turn to uh, Justin in a minute and then we'll do questions. You know, anyone who has questions to uh, um, Joe or Justin or, or to me about the previous part, please use the, use the ask the question. I'll ask in the meantime, just, just one question. What's So looking at at the past two years, what's the thing that surprised you most about, uh, you know, the life of uh, VDF as a concept? So, maybe the most surprising thing was that, uh, you know, we we published our general paper with some kind of generic constructions um, using, you know, generic succinct proof techniques. Uh, we had sort of written off the idea of doing it in a group of unknown order initially. And then, of course, uh, you know, June 2018, within weeks of our paper appearing, there were two independent uh, constructions that, uh, you know, you might talk a little bit more about of repeating, repeated squaring in a group of unknown order. Um, so it was pretty interesting because we had these two constructions from, you know, two different people that work in different ways, you know, produce the same proof. Uh, almost at the same time. And then since then, we've had nothing. So we basically know you know, two ways to do that proof and various ways that sort of combine or remix those two. Uh, there's hybrids of the two, but, um, you know, if you'd asked me in July 2018, I would have said, ah, oh, well, you know, in two years we'll have 10 ways to do this proof, but somehow like two is the magic number, which is, uh, yeah, quite, quite interesting. 
and we still don't really have a deeper sense like if there are no other ways to do it fundamentally or uh you know if if there are so okay cool so uh um I'll, I'll still leave you here on screen and let's move to uh, Justin if uh, you can enlighten us as to the state of uh, you know VDF efforts in the world um, and then we'll take questions again please just uh, send them in the ask a question yeah go ahead Justin thanks Eddie um, it's possible that the talk I prepared is not the talk you're expecting um, so Ali asked me to give kind of a, a big picture of uh, on, on, on VDFs, and the way I interpreted that, to that was basically, you know, what are the fundamentals? So if we ignore all the implementation details, which could be very different depending on the type of VDF that you have, you know, it could be based on stocks or snarks, or it could be, you know, using groups of unknown order or all sorts of stuff. And instead, just assume you have this black box, like what are like um, fundamental features uh, of, of, of VDFs? Um, so I'll, I'll do that and um, let's see how it goes. So um, I mean, on, on, the, on the fact that VDFs are only two years old, um, you know, the reason why I think it's worth highlighting is because usually it takes a very long time for cryptographic primitives to go from research to production, um, you know, maybe a decade or maybe even several decades. Uh, but in this specific instance, um, you know, we're already seeing uh, VDFs um, uh, in, in production, and I'll, I, I will talk about the, the various use cases and the various blockchains that are um, looking to use uh, VDFs. But kind of before that, I want to make sure that um, I kind of want to make sure that the, the, the very basic example is understood, which is the un unbiasable randomness. So I really like Ellie's uh, metaphor of, of the roulette, and basically. When you want to have unbiasable randomness with VDFs, there's kind of two phases. There's like a, an entropy phase and an extraction phase. And in the roulette, you basically have the person throwing the dice who's like the entropy generator, right? So he's throwing the dice at a specific speed and spin and position. And, and then you have this, this long extraction phase where the, the, the roulette wheel will slowly so, slow down and settle down. And then, you know, the random number, like, reveals itself and kind of the if you want to implement this in the blockchain what um, that follows this metaphor is basically you have um, entropy generation which comes from a proof of work so you have a block hash and then you do the um, the uh, kind of the randomness extraction uh, using using a VDF uh, and randomness extraction here is in time not in space so usually when you do when you say random extraction, you talk, you're thinking about a, a pseudo random generator, which has a seed, and then you can extract as much randomness as you want kind of in space, but here it's extraction in time. So it's slightly different. And then there's this other metaphor um, about unbiasable randomness. And this more closely matches what we do in Ethereum 2.0. So it might be worth um, you know, just mentioning the metaphor. So just imagine that you have a black box and in the box, you have some dice and you have a hundred people and you invite each of these people one by one to shake the box. Um, and at the very end, you have, you open the box and you look uh, at the random numbers and that will be, you look at the, the dice and that will be the kind of a fair random number. And um, as long as one person, you know, was not lazy and actually did the work of shaking the box, um, then uh, then you have a random number. And so what the entropy phase here is all the shaking, and that's basically Randall, where you have 100 people who can reveal some entropy, which is mixed together. And then you have the extraction phase, which is the same with, with the VDF. And one of the cool things about VDF-based randomness is that um, it's the only way that we know to get unbiasable randomness with strong liveness and strong unpredictability. So by strong, I mean that um, you just need a kind of one person in the world to act honestly and, and, and the whole thing will, will, um, will have the properties that you want as opposed to you know, a, a, a threshold of participants in the committee, right? So, um, you have this threshold cryptography, which is based on committees, but then you have honesty assumptions, and that that kind of uh, is not is not as good 
Um, okay, so kind of one important point that I want to stress about VDFs, which is really cool, is that um, VDFs are part of what I what I'm coining crypto physics. Okay, so you have pure cryptography, and then you have crypto economics. And now we have this new branch of cryptography, which is crypto physics, which basically is about crypto primitives, which have a deep connection with physical resources, right? So possibly like the, the first, you know, um, you know, exciting um, crypto physical um, primitive was with proof of work and it linked cryptography and energy, right? Energy consumption. And VDF is the same thing, but linking with time and, and time consumption. Um, and, you know, you kind of have these surprising links, right? So um, who knew, who would have guessed that once you have a link to energy, you can do consensus, right? You can do Nakamoto consensus and, and, and all these exciting things. And it's kind of like, for me at least, it's a surprising connection that you can go from time to randomness. You know, this deep connection between time and randomness is, is something pretty cool. Um, and I think it's a, it's a reason to be excited about this cryptographic primitive, which is not only is it a, 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 a traditional building block like any other cryptographic primitive, like signatures or snarks or whatever, or hash functions, but it, it has this twist, which uh, makes it more exciting. Um, and one thing I want to kind of clarify is that um, so you, you, you can think of these as, as oracles for energy consumption or time consumption, but these are approximate oracles in the sense that, um, you know, proof of work will, will tell you that, that, you know, some amount of energy is being burnt, um, but you don't know it, it exactly because you don't know um, the efficiency of the hardware that you're running. And it's very similar with, with um, VDFs, you know, different hardware will run at different speeds. And so all you get is a lower bound. So you know, for example, that at least one minute has elapsed. It could be more, but at least you have this guaranteed delay. So it's it's more about a delay than it is actual a clock, which will tell you the time. Okay, so one of the cool things about crypto physics is that it's it's easier to reason about than crypto economics, right? With crypto economics, you have you have to model people and people have tons of complexity about them. You know, you need to model rational behavior and bribing and incentives and it becomes very complicated very quickly. Um, and in crypto physics, you have a departure from pure cryptography, but the departure is fairly moderate and it's easy, it's much easier to, to, um, to, to reason about. And so one of the things, for example, is that in the context of VDFs, so you can take your function and you can analyze the information theoretically, kind of the depth of your circuit. So the way that we compute functions in hardware is by with, with circuits, right? We have these transistors and wires, and then you can you can prove theorems about these circuits. You can prove that it's you know you need at least ten transistors for every repeated iteration, something like that. And then you can make physical. Um, you know, uh, observations around like speed of light and uh, and like information density and like things like that. So it's, um, you know, you, you do need to make some sort of assumption around how much faster an attacker can go. So what is the, uh, the maximum advantage? Um, but um, th making this assumption is, is something that's, um, that's easier to do and reason about than traditional crypto economics. And you know one of the, the things that's kind of cool here with these two crypto physical um, primitives, um, proof of work and VDFs, is that they're actually solving the same problem, um, and basically randomness. So you, you can think of of proof of work as a random number generation, right? So it's about picking at random. It's about sampling a you know fairly a a, a um, a block producer, a, the, the lucky miner. Um, and it's interesting to contrast the two. So in, in proof of work, you need what's called majority honesty. So you need at, you know 51% of the miners to be honest for the, for the, the scheme to, to work. Whereas with VDFs, 
you only need minimal um, honesty. You just need one person in the world to basically do the computation, uh, which is actually very similar to, um, to, to SNARKs, right? So you, if you have a statement that you want to prove, you just need one person in the world to snarkify that statement and then broadcast the proof to the world. Um, so you have this, this big asymmetry, which is, which is very cool. Um, and so one of the consequences of this is that the overall power consumption of producing this randomness is, is significantly lower, you know, by orders of magnitude relative to proof of work. And the other advantage is that you have unbiasable randomness as opposed to biasable randomness. Um, so really, at least if you focus on the randomness, you have much better randomness at a much um, a lower cost. Okay, so that's kind of the, the fundamentals of kind of crypto physics. Um, and then the, the other fundamental point about VDFs is the, the hardware aspect. You know, it doesn't matter how you implement, go ahead, Ellie. <laughs> No, I just wanted to say that first of all, I already shamelessly tweeted that you, you know, you suggested crypto physics as a new uh, domain, and I really like it. And just a random thought that I have no idea how to connect it, but like you know, entropy is this. There's this. It's this amazing deep concept in in physics. You know, second law of thermodynamics, and and it also shows up in, of course, computer science and information theory. So, but you know, I need to digest and parse all of this in the area of crypto physics, but I just really like it. Anyway, sorry, uh, go on. Yeah, and uh, I see there's no questions, but feel free to ask questions if you have any. So the, the other kind of fundamentals of VDFs is like the hardware aspect, right? So you have, you basically have a new security model. Like traditionally cryptography does have some security assumptions which are rooted in the real world. So if you think of, for example, computational security, like for example, when you say I have 128 bits of you know, computational soundness, what it means is that you're basically assuming that an attacker won't be able to do two to the 128 computational steps to, to, to break, um, to break your, your cryptographic system. Um, but here it's a parallel model, right? So these 200, two to the 128 steps can be conducted in parallel. And so here we're changing the model a little bit. We're basically doing two things. One is that we're um, restricting the computation to sequential computation. Um, and and you know, the term that's usually used is inher inherent, inherently sequential computation. So you can't really speed it up with parallelism. And then the second thing you're doing is that you're, you're placing a time bound. Okay, so you're saying, for example, in one minute, it's impossible for an attacker to do, you know, let's say a, a billion units of, of sequential computation. You know, that, that's kind of the assumptions that you're um, putting forward. And that's what we usually translate as the Amax, the maximum speed advantage. So that's going to be the assumed maximum advantage that an attacker has relative to commodity hardware, right? So if you're computing your VDF on the CPU, um, and it takes, let's say, uh, one nanosecond per operation, um, and you, you know, you have an Amax of ten. What that means is that you're assuming that an attacker, no matter what hardware, you know, they, they, they try to build, they won't be able to run every step faster than, you know, point one nanoseconds, a hundred picoseconds, and. Um, you know, you can make this a pure crypto physical assumption. You know, you can start analyzing your know, speed of light and things like that, and get really, really, you know, conservative um, bounds. But what you do in practice is that actually you relax this a little bit, and you make it you make it more of a crypto economic assumption. So you have you say, okay, as an attacker, you have a, a, some sort of budget to build hardware. Let's say you have a billion dollar budget, um, and what can you do with a billion dollars? Well, you, you know, you can get the absolute state of the art. You can build a state of the art ASIC. You know, you can do state of the art cooling and overclocking and 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 things like that. Um, and then, and then you make an appropriate um, a max assumption uh, based on this. And it's important to take into account things like exotic hardware, right? So traditional hardware is built on on on, on silicon. But what about you know carbon nanotubes or what about optical computing? 
you know, all of these things need to be taken into account uh, when you look uh, at the AMAX. And you also need to look at um, fancy algorithms, right? So maybe the algorithm that you're used to is optimized for, for bandwidth, or maybe it's optimized for, for power. But here, really, you want to consider the algorithm which is optimized for latency, which is rarely what is done um, in, in CPUs, for example. OK, so one, one of the key weaknesses of VDFs, VDFs are amazing across the board, but they have one weakness. OK, and the one weakness is that you have to wait. And it's kind of obvious that you know, it's all about time and, and delay and waiting. But what this means in practice is that um, you, have, you have latency, right? Um, so you, know, the, you can generate uh, randomness, but it will, it will take time. And, and uh, this, this latency will basically be um, aggravated by your Amax. Right, so if if you want to, you know, if, if you need, let's say, a delay of one minute to a guaranteed delay of one minute to generate randomness, and your Amax is ten, then now suddenly you need to actually wait ten minutes, right? Because one minute times ten, ten minutes um, of 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 running the CPU on, on your commodity hardware uh, to make sure that an attacker with hardware which is ten times faster can't squeeze the 10 minutes down to less than one minute. OK, so one of the things you really want from a, a UX perspective is to have a reasonable Amax. Right? In theory, Amax is parametrizable. So you can make it you know, as large as you want you know, to guarantee safety, but then suddenly you're losing on UX. Um, so this is where you want to consider hardware acceleration, like GPUs, FPGAs, ASICs. And you know, one of the things that we're doing at the uh, VZF Alliance is trying to build um, basically a, a, an, an ASIC with so that the Amax is, is kind of as small as possible so that it's in, in the realm of practicality. Um, and just to give you some concrete numbers, we have this modular squaring, uh, which takes about 1,000 nanoseconds on the CPU. It takes about um, 30 nanoseconds on an FPGA, and it takes about two nanoseconds on an ASIC, right? So we, we have this 500x speed up, um, which basically translates into 500x better Amax than if we were to use uh, CPUs. So on this topic of hardware, one of the, the, the cool things about hardware, and it's very different than proof of work, is that you have very long life hardware. You can have hardware, VDF hardware that lasts you know, a decade or maybe even several decades. And like one of the reasons is that um, you, know, you can parametrize your AMAX. So you can pick an AMAX which is very conservative and, and keep it there, or you, know, you can um, adjust it over time as hardware becomes uh, you know, better and better. Um, um, and I mean, one of the things that we will have to do in the context of the, if, um, of the VDF um, Alliance is do a one-time hardware refresh for, for um, quantum security, right? But other than this one-time uh, hardware refresh, the, the hardware should last for a very long time. And this is you know, the ex extreme opposite of, of uh, proof of work, where every time you have a new generation of, of node, um, you have to, you know, it's a new incentive to try and, 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 and rebuild from scratch and, and trash all the old hardware. Okay, and now in terms of the um, the uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I just want to point out that we need to answer questions, and then uh, um, okay. Right. okay, yeah, go ahead. All right, I could take a stab at. Uh, obvious question if you uh, want me to. Uh, yeah, so I see the question uh, Avi asked is, when calculating AMAX, do we take into account post-quantum calculation? That's a good question. I haven't thought about it too much. Um, well, I mean, I guess, you know, a lot of proposed, uh, well, VDFs are not quantum resistant and that they require a trusted setup that can be broken. You know, they require an RSA modulus that can be factored. So, uh, yeah, in that regime, there's no post quantum security anyway. So it, it's AMAX is kind of irrelevant. Um, 
I'm not a quantum uh, computing expert. Uh, you know, generally, I, I ha haven't been brought to believe that quantum computing is going to decrease latency of computations. So it's not something that uh, that we usually think about. The other thing with with VDFs and post quantum that's different than uh, different than encryption is that if uh, you know if somebody comes out with a quantum computer six months from now, even if you knew that quantum computers would exist in six months, it wouldn't really mean it was insecure to use uh, a non post quantum uh, like a quantum vulnerable VDF today. Um, you could still generate your randomness. It's not like encrypting where you want, uh, you know, you, you worry about an attacker six months in the future being able to break your encryption and read your secrets that, you know, that would still be, you'd still want to be secret in six months. Um, you know, pretty much as soon as your VDF based protocol, you generate your randomness is finished, then there's sort of a forward security. It doesn't matter from that point on if, if uh, quantum computers sort of instantly become practical. Um, you know, it's just like all things, it's very hard to switch. So we need a plan for a post-quantum VDF before that date. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in, in general, we, we just have to switch sort of before quantum computers become generally available and not, not like decades before, like with encryption. I will point out that the VDF that uh, I'll describe soon is uh, plausibly post-quantum secure. Of course, yeah. OK, next uh, question. Uh, who wants to take it? Um, VRF. But I'll, I'll just request that we uh, that we do it briefly because I uh, we I want to save time for uh, describing the uh, start based VF. Okay, Justin. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I need to read the question and understand. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> so VRF, uh, the advantage of using VDF uh, over a VRF. Yeah. No VDF and not VRF. I re so I really dislike the term VRF because it's a very fancy word for something completely trivial. Um, and, um, you know, we have VRFs in Ethereum 2.0 with, uh, with Randall. And basically, as soon as you have a, a for example, a deterministic signature scheme, that that's an easy way to a, a VRF, um, and um, yeah, VRFs are cool, uh, but they suffer this one problem, which is biasability. Um, so if you want unbiasability, you want to combine basically a VRF and a VDF. Okay. So next, uh, uh, is optimization for latency not well understood? Does that mean we're thirty years behind in algorithmic research? Aha. Uh -huh. So. Um, it looks like pretty much all the VDFs that we know of, the, the one based on stocks, the one based on groups of unknown order, the one based on um, you know, isogenies and all these crazy stuff, they're all based fundamentally on modular multiplication. And it turns out that mo modular mul multiplication, we understand extremely well. Um, so we, it used to be that the state of the art was that the circuit depth was three log n um, where n is going to be your, your, your number of bits that you're multiplying. Uh, but thanks to the uh, research that we've been doing at the v, uh, VDF Alliance, we actually got that down to 2n. And the reason why 2n is exciting is because you know, we actually have lower bounds um, that are extremely close to 2n. So we have, you know, we, we have a lower bound of at least log n, and we, it's possible that we can even prove a, a lower bound of, of 2 log n. So basically, the upper bound and lower bound are, are, are very, very squeezed. Um, and then the question is purely, you know, process manufacturing. Um, and it, it, it turns out that, um, you know, we, at least the silicon stuff we understand extremely well. And the good news about the exotic stuff is that it, it just doesn't scale, right? So if you want to build a modular multiplier for, you know, a thousand bits, you know, with millions, tens of millions of transistors, it's just... It does, doesn't scale. The, the, the prototypes that we can build today is like on the order of maybe 10,000 transistors or something like this. So, um, yeah, it's possible that we will have these massive speed ups uh, in the future. And the, 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 the worrying thing is that an attacker just needs to build one single um, VDF with this exotic hardware and it, it breaks. And so this is a little bit of a downside of actually your construction, Eddie, because you have these 
small ex um, modular uh, squarings, uh, and 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 those can those are much smaller circuits, and so potentially they're within the realm of feasibility uh, for things like carbon nanotubes or optical computing. Okay. Yeah. I guess I just add one piece to that, which is that yeah, I mean, since uh, you know the industry that the silicon you know transistor industry hasn't focused on latency optimization as much, uh, you know that it is potentially a weakness because there. Are, you know, there are like lots of researchers sitting around who have thought about this, who have been like begging for an application to put on all their uh, their grant applications. Um, so my prediction is that in you know five years there will be a lot of random hardware people who are putting on there at the first paragraph of their you know grant application like, oh, my research on this exotic. Uh, uh, computation, you know, uh, machine is important because it could affect the security of VDFs, which hopefully at this point are used for real lotteries and things. So, you know, it's, we could inadvertently kick off some sort of, uh, you know, renaissance of, uh, electrical engineers getting interested in, uh, in this stuff, yeah. which would be you know, exciting, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will answer the last question and I'll also take this, uh, time to thank both of our guests and uh and and continue like just uh, because okay the i'll just the answer to your question Jakob, is just that uh, yes uh, basically the one vdf construction that is uh um uh, that is uh you know not based on a group of unknown order is the one that i want to describe now so i will um um i guess i will uh, thank you very much uh both Joe and, uh, and Justin, and I will uh, go back to the, um, you know, to the uh, explaining just a very, very specific uh, construction of a VDF that is also a time lock. And it's the nice thing about it is that other than the Stark part, it's a very uh, a simple construction. So basically, um, <clears throat> going back, so now I want to describe the construction. So this goes back to, uh, um, um, in the words of uh, um, RSW, they, uh, the, the paper on time blocks, they, they said what you want is a function that behaves like uh, uh, a woman who is pregnant, meaning uh, it takes nine months for one woman to give birth to a child. If you take two women and uh, they are both pregnant, you won't get a baby in, in four and a half months. Uh, you can't uh, slow it down, um, you know, not that we know of. So we want something that is inherently sequential. And here is a construction, and this construction is, is rather old. It goes back to papers by Dwolk and O'O, and also to the construction of a function called Sloth by uh, Lenstra and Vasilovsky. And the nice thing about it is that it's very simple. So we start with some uh, P, uh, which is a, a prime. Okay, actually it could be any field. Uh, and what we want is, let's suppose that three does not divide P minus one. This means that the mapping that goes from X to X cubed is a one-to-one -one map, meaning uh, it's sort of a permutation on, on all of the field. That's all we need. So let's describe a function that is very fast in one way. So we're given uh, our input is uh, some uh, X zero. And what we do is uh, we run this loop that says four i less than t, and think of t equaling something huge, like you know t equals whatever ten to the nine, something like a billion steps. What do we want to do? So t equals this thing. What we want to do is um, basically we we say that x i um, equals x i minus one raised to power three plus uh, let's say forty two. And all of this will be modulo p. So this is repeated uh, cubing plus a constant, and we just repeated many, many times. So this is a very simple function. Um, it requires something like two t uh, multiplications, right? Mod p in order to reach the answer. So this is uh, the way we can actually. This is the way uh, our um, time lock works, basically. You take, uh, suppose you have a secret and you want to lock it, so you use it as your x0, and 
what you do is you uh, return or output to everyone, uh, basically you return the number T um, and uh, XT. And now the point is if you want to unlock this, you need to reverse. So this is the, uh, you know, this is the lock. And if you want to uh, uh, unlock, um, I guess, right, what you're going to do is the other way around. So uh, for, let me just, uh, suppose you want, want to unlock it. So what you're going to do is you will say that, uh, It will say for your input is now uh, xt, and now you go for i less than t. What you do is uh, uh, xi minus one. Uh, yeah, I guess. Well, you know what I mean. I'm going down in decreasing order. My programming skills aren't very good, but you get the point, right? It will be um, xi, well, I mean, it will be xi plus one, and this will actually be, be xi, right? Uh, you do minus 42, and now you raise it to the power one third. So the inverse of uh, the power that is raising to the power three, and do all of this modulo p. And then at the very end, you return, uh, uh, x zero. So the only thing we need is for i, you know, goes from I guess right. Uh, what we need is for, from i going from t down to one. We basically do this reverse. So the main thing to notice is that um, if you want to compute x to the one third uh, mod p, this is equivalent to taking x, raising it to the power two p minus one uh, divided by three. Um, and you can check later on and see that if you take this thing and raise it to power three, assuming three does not uh, uh, divide p minus one, you will get back uh, to x. This uses Fermat's little theorem. But the main thing to notice is that taking the cube root of, of x is something that requires uh, raising to power that is pretty much p. Now, why is this important? Um, let's suppose that p... Uh, you know, that log base 2 of P is something pretty large. So I don't know, like 128. So it's like 128-bit prime. What we get here is what the um, VDF paper called a time asymmetric encoding because um, you'll see here that um, the locking takes you time, 2T multiplication, multiplications, whereas um, this part over here takes you um, something like on the order of log base 2 times t multiplications. So if log base 2 of p is 128, we get something that you can do 64 times faster in one direction than in the other. So uh, 64 times faster means that if you run this loop for the equivalent of one second, it will take roughly one minute to unlock it in this other in this other direction, right? So we get a time a time asymmetric probably missing a, uh, an M here encoding, right? Something that is very fast in one direction. That's the red part. That's very fast, but is much slower in the reverse direction, and Another mental image to have here is something like a jigsaw puzzle. So a jigsaw puzzle is something that is very fast to uh, scramble. That's the red direction, but is much slower to scramble. And that's the uh, purple direction. And um, you can either use the purple direction in order to make something very slow. So you can take, let's say, the latest block header or some randomness that Justin was referring to and, and bring it into this loop and it will take you um, you know, a minute or five minutes or 10 minutes, or you could also combine it with the red part and use it as a time lock. So you could uh, run, let's say, uh, this loop for the red loop, for, let's say five seconds. And then if effectively you get the analog of uh, locking something for five minutes. So this is the delay function that 
we are interested in building using a Stark, and uh, this does not rely on a group of unknown order. To the best of our knowledge, uh, quantum computers are not going to be uh, effective in breaking this thing. Um, and now the only thing you may be wondering about is how, what does this have to do with, with, uh, with a Stark or with any proof system, right? Because um, we described here a function that in one direction is very fast, that's the red one, and then the other direction is roughly 60 times slower. Um, both of them are like three lines of pseudocode. Why would you want a uh, Stark in this, uh, you know, why are we talking about this here? So I'll just pause here for uh, and see if there are any questions um, while we're here uh, sort of, uh, um, okay, I don't see any questions. So um, let's go back and um, explain why you would want a, a, a Stark to help you out here. Good. So, Suppose you want the VDF thing. I mean, let's give some uh, concrete numbers. So you probably need um, T. Um, you probably need um, T, you know, practically. Suppose you want a delay. Let's put in some numbers and see why you, you would need a Stark. Okay. Um, you probably want T to be on the order of something like... Uh, you know, uh, 10 to the nine or so, right? Like roughly 1 billion. And why? Because um, one uh, multiplication is between, let's say, let's suppose that one multiplication is roughly one nanosecond for simplicity. So you have, um, you can do 1 billion multiplications in a second. So you can run your loop, let's say, for one second uh, to lock something. And then the unlocking would be one minute. And that's assuming that uh, modular, a, single, a single modular multiplication takes one nanosecond. So 10 to the 9 is roughly um, the, the number of iterations of the loop, uh, the, the value t you would need to take in order to give you roughly a one minute uh, delay. And this is a very crude estimate. Uh, later on, I can give you more, or others can give you more accurate ones. But this is, you know, ballparking it because it's like, uh, this is roughly uh, a good number. So now, suppose you want to verify this. Okay, so all you need to do is verify a billion multiplications. So we could use the, uh, right, we could use the, uh, this to verify correctness of the delay. Meaning, suppose we took the latest block header, and what we did is we applied the, the purple loop to it, and we did it for roughly one minute. Well, we can send, uh, you know, xt and x0 to the chain, and then have the chain, let's say the Ethereum blockchain, verify using the uh, red loop. The problem is that you need um, to pay, so this is roughly, uh, this is roughly, uh, you know, you need to pay 10 to the 9 multiplications. And if you look at the gas costs on Ethereum, this is roughly going to cost you, you know, roughly something like 10 to the 10 gas. And 10 to the 10 gas is very prohibitive. It will occupy all of uh, uh, Ethereum's blockchain for, I guess, a few days. Or, you know, I didn't compute it, but... Uh, Sorry, a thousand uh, blocks, which is a pretty, you know, that's that's pretty expensive and pretty hefty. So you don't want that. You want something that will speed this up. Well, enter um, uh, a Stark, and that's where you want a Stark or any other succinct or any succinct uh, uh, proof system that you have. And now what you're going to do is you're going to look at the red uh, at the red algorithm. And you're going to speed it up using a Stark. So you're going to take the statement that is uh, what this uh, red algorithm runs. You will say, I ran um, the red algorithm, the faster algorithm. I ran it for a billion steps. And uh, the on input x0, the output is xt. And here's a proof of it. 
And the nice thing about proof systems, and this is already an observation that appears in the VDF paper, um, the nice thing about proof systems, succinct proof systems, and in particular Starks, um, the verification time of this equals poly log of t, which is, of course, much, much smaller than t. So instead of paying, uh, you know, 10 to the 10 gas because you need to compute 10 to the 9 multiplications naively, you're going to actually pay something, you know, your gas goes down to roughly something like 2 million gas. And this, these are now actual numbers on the VDF, that on this VDF that we'll be running, which is, of course, much, much smaller than, uh, you know, 10 uh, billion gas. Um, and 2 million gas is something that actually fits very comfortably inside a single block of Ethereum, which has which allowed 10 million gas, whereas 10 billion gas, which is the naive verification, would cost a lot more. So um, summarizing uh, what uh, the VDF that you could do, and again, this is not, uh, this itself is not a, a new idea. This is an idea that already appears in the uh, beautiful paper by uh, Joe and, and his colleagues in the VDF papers is to take this time asymmetric encoding and you can take a very simple one, which is the one that we have here. And for the delay, you can uh, ask for the uh, purple uh, loop, which is very slow. And then for verification, you can apply a Stark to the red direction. And another benefit is that as far as a computation, actually the computer program that you need to verify with a start in this case is extremely simple, right? Because you are iterating over a loop that does two multiplications and a single addition. And in terms of a program where it's algebraic intermediate representation, it is an extremely simple program. It literally has like, you know, one constraint that, that specifies what the computation should do. Um, so this is something that, that actually Starker is uh, implementing and deploying soon. And, uh, um, you know, I, I want to, at the very end of the talk to allow um, Kineret and Tom from, from Starkware just to, you know, for those who are interested, they can stay and hear a few details about you know, the practical aspect of this. But before we get there, I just want to mention two uh, attack surfaces that one has to consider on, because it's all about the delay and being sure that the delay is indeed, you know, correct. So I'll pause for questions. We'll talk about attacks and mitigations. And then uh, we'll end the formal part. Those who want to hear more are welcome to stay on. So let's see if there are questions. Okay, good. I see there's a question. Is it the same constant 42 for all rounds? Okay, so in this, uh, in this uh, uh, simplified version, 42 is the answer to all questions, as we all know. So it must be uh, the one constant for all rounds. Um, uh, uh, more seriously, I, I want to say two things. First of all, we don't know of anything that would make even the constant being one um, a problem across all rounds. We don't know that this is not secure. Practically, uh, because, you know, who knows what might come up, we are actually using, uh, I believe, something like 64 round constants, and not all of them are 42. Um, but but uh, there's a really terrific uh, theoretical question, which is if you fix you know the same constant across all rounds, and you could even make that constant one or the worst possible constant. I mean zero is a problem because for obvious reasons, if you're just taking repeated cube roots, then then it's very easy to speed up the um, computation. But we don't know of any constant that if you add it, you will reach something problematic, and it's it's a really good question to uh, you know think about. Um, Okay, good. So now I want to talk uh, briefly about two kinds of attacks and how they might be mitigated. So let's go back and look at this uh, um, at this purple thing, right? Uh, the delay function that we want no one to be able uh, to attack or compute faster is this uh, loop. And there are two obvious, okay, there's one obvious way to attack it and one less obvious way, and I want to discuss both of them. So the obvious way to attack it is one that already uh, Justin referred to, and it is um, basically based on, sorry, just one second. It is based on, um, it is based on hardware, right? So 
if someone comes along with faster hardware, then maybe uh, you know the clock speed or whatnot would be much faster. And then the delay, we, we are hoping for a delay of one minute, but it will actually be a delay of only one second or half a second and so on. So um, one nice advantage about um, the particular construction that, that we're using is that we're working with very uh, small uh, P. Um, in particular, the one that we're going for is 128 bits, but you can also work with 64 bits as well, uh, or you can work with uh, other small moduli. And why is this good? This is good because um, uh, the whole world has access to very, very efficient 64-bit uh, multipliers and also to 128-bit multipliers on their uh, hardware, on their CPUs, uh, so 64-bit multiplication and also 128-bit multiplication to a lesser extent, but still have been very uh, significantly optimized on, on standard CPUs and they work uh, you know, at, at very high speeds with high clock rate. So while someone could obviously go and super optimize the case of 64-bit multiplication, um, since this is a very, uh, you know, it's a commodity kind of operation, um, the whole world has already put in significant amount of, of funds and research in order to make it very fast for everyone. And this makes it, uh, it, it sort of raises the bar, right? It would make it harder for hardware producers to go and super optimize 64-bit or 128-bit operations. It's not that they can't, but there's uh, less of a gap in the small bit range that is uh, built into hardware than it is with respect to, let's say, you know, 2048-bit uh, multiplication that isn't on commodity hardware. So this is the hardware attack, and it's a serious attack, and uh, uh, the, 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 the mitigation that uh, one can see for now is that uh, basically we, we all have access to pretty fast hardware, making it harder for an attacker to get a significant speed up. The second one is, is uh, using math. So if you look at this, uh, um, if you look at this uh, loop, you know, no, there's an obvious way to, to prove uh, or to go over it and, and compute the delay. And it goes by uh, you know, applying this, this loop and like taking x and raising it to power 2p minus 1 divided by 3 and repeating this. But there could be other ways uh, to, to speed things up. And, and uh, you could, uh, you know, one that we're particularly aware of is using the GCD of basically the loop that you care about and the field equation, which is, uh, you know, x to the p minus x. So I don't want to go into, you know, a lot of math details on this. When we write a paper, we'll explain what's going on here. But there are potential um, attack vectors that look into speeding up uh, this thing by basically uh, combining a few iterations of the loop and looking for a solution for them at once. Um, the mitigation for this that, that makes it much, much harder to uh, perform this is uh, have a state um, with m greater than one field elements, which means, and this is another thing that we're actually going to be doing, which means suppose that x now, uh, each one of these state variables is not a single field element, but maybe two or three or four. Each one of them is 128 bits. And then what you do is in each, in each iteration of the loop, you first of all take a cube root for each one of them separately. And then you mix them linearly with some random, with a fixed linear combination, and then you repeat this process. So what happens is that now you need to, uh, you can still, uh, you know, to get the speed up, you need to do much more, uh, you know, it's a much harder problem. There are, you know, harder algorithms um, do exist for this problem of speeding up. Um, they're based on things like resultants um, and uh, Grebner basis and a lot of uh, very fancy um, terms, but that, that again, I don't want to go into because we don't have time, but, but the point is that it makes it much, much harder to uh, do these attacks and uh, asymptotically, sorry, and also to implement them in, in efficient hardware makes it uh, uh, much harder um, to get any sort of advantage over the naive execution. So I just want to summarize this part and say that 
There are hardware-based attacks that, that could potentially be leveled against this thing. And uh, you can always like super cool or overclock uh, hardware or come up with some exotic new thing. Um, the fact that it uses small moduli is some mitigation to that. And you can always deploy new uh, math to this problem. Uh, moving to larger state size uh, makes most of that math uh, you know, impractical, but there's uh, no end to the amount of math that could be deployed. And uh, this is, of course, another terrific research question. You know, can someone speed this, uh, uh, speed up the delay computation further? Okay, so now um, I'm going to answer questions. And then um, for those, and then, you know, we're done with sort of the abstract theoretical discussion of VDFs and so on. Um, those interested in, in you know, very concrete and practical details about uh, the VDF that Starkware will deploying, you know, within a week or two as a service on, on the main chain are, are invited to stay after I answer the questions. But I want to stress that, uh, you know, that's not part of the, I don't, I don't want to sort of impose, um, you know, Starkware uh, deployment things on, on this kind of lecture series that's far more, you know, abstract and theoretical and generic. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm now going to answer the questions. So, um, oh, it's a question, I guess, to Justin. Is there progress on HLS? VDF comp was all about very lot. Okay, good. So, uh, Justin, you're invited to join back. I'll just answer the other question. Meanwhile, I see Justin is already there. Do you plan to use a fixed P, randomized P uh, between VDF evaluation? So uh, that's another great, uh, you know, parameter that you can tweak, uh, especially against ASIC, sort of uh, changing the, the P. In the first iteration, it will be one fixed P, um, but, but you know, if you want to mitigate ASIC attacks and so on, you may want to move across several different Ps. So that one I answered, and I'll let uh, Justin answer the other question. So Justin, please uh, go ahead if you're still around. Yeah, I'm still around. So, um... Yeah, we've made lots of progress. Um, we have a um, so we've we've written the, um, the the source code. We've we've done the the the, the synthesis and the place and route. So you know we've done very we've gone very very far in the development of uh, of the hardware, and it it runs in roughly two nanoseconds. Um, so it's possible we can shrink it down with a bit more work. You know, maybe one point five or Something like that, but um, yeah, we're, we're we're quite close. There's a, there's actually a, um, a, a medium a blog posts which uh, talk about it, um, which I'll I'll link uh, in the in the discussion. One possible next step is to do what's called a shuttle run. So a shuttle run is where you you share the mask. So the way that you build hardware is that you have these masks, and they're quite expensive. You know, like. We're talking like several million dollars for, for a set of masks. So to make it cheaper, if you want to do a test run, is you share the mask with lots of uh, different people. And so we look, and that's called a shuttle run. So we're looking to, we're considering a shuttle run uh, relatively soon to test our design and see, see if it works with the performance that we're expecting. And the, the source code, the RTL, will be open sourced uh, very soon. Cool. So um, 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 again, this uh, this is uh, sort of this ends the part about abstract discussion of uh, VDFs and uh, Starks. Um, what uh, for those who are interested? So uh, anyone who wants to uh, is not interested in, in practical details, um, you're you're definitely welcome uh, to uh, leave. Uh, the next talk in two weeks will be focusing on. ETH Stark, which is the um, um, open source code for a very efficient um, Stark prover and verifier for the rescue function, which is the outcome of the Ethereum Foundation grant. I guess Justin uh, is going to be invited again for that part because it has a very uh, uh, big role in that thing. But uh, that will be in, in another two weeks. So. Uh, as I said, um, we we're going to be so, so we as Starkware right now is going to be deploying a, a VDF as a service as a layer two thing based on the, the, this uh, Stark uh, Stark VDF construction that I uh, described now. 
And I just want to move over, hand it over to uh, Kineret and also, um, so Kineret is an engineer with uh, Starkware and Tom is a, um, is a uh, product manager with Starkware. If, if, so please go, go ahead and uh, explain a little bit about what we're going to do. I think Tom is still not uh, connected. Can you maybe? I will, uh, yes, I will try to make Tom connected. What I see here is it says Tom says uh, it said that he's accepted and connecting. Tom, are you with us? I think not yet. Okay, in the meanwhile, I'll, I can share the screen. So you will see the, the contract. Um, we are going to publish. Let's make that bigger. Tom is there, so. Uh, Tom is not there, but I'll try to connect him. So, um, Kineret, I think you're all on your own. Okay. So, um, here is the contract that we are going to publish. Um, I think that, first of all, uh, let's note it that this is the mapping for the randomness. So, what you're, what you're seeing here is the, um, is the contract that will register the new randomness and will um, and this is going to be I'm going to present the API that uh, someone that wants to get the randomness that our VDF will calculate is going to um, to go to ask this contract the, to send a, transac a transaction for this contract. So uh, here you can see the, the API. There is the API for the randomness. So given a block number, uh, you can get the randomness that was calculated based on this block number. And you get zero if the, uh, the randomness was not calculated uh, on that specific uh, block number. And here is the function that you can get the, the latest randomness. So, uh, um, so you can also ask for the last one that was already calculated. Uh, so this is a very simple uh, API, and this is what we are going to present in our POC. Um, I think what's uh, interesting to show here is how we do the registration of the new randomness. So of course, um, we need to, um, I will go down here, and uh, maybe first I, I want to show you the, how, what is the um, input for the registration? So, of course, we need a block number, which is the um, which is the block that we are choosing to calculate the VDF based on its hash. And now we have the block hash, and of course, we need to make sure that these two are uh, consistent. And we have the public input for the for the proof of this uh, calculation. Um, we do some, we check some stuff and uh, that everything is compatible. And um, and here is the main logic. So um, we uh, we calculate the randomness. Yeah, we uh, we uh, based on what that was um, based on the proof, and uh, we register it in our uh, mapping. This is very high level of uh, description of uh, of the the logic of this contract. So let me let me just add to that. It uh, um, so when it uh, first goes online, it will be very um, you know it will be sort of a proof of concept things, which means that roughly once every three hours we will be running this. It will take. Uh, you know, this uh, smart contract will sort of uh, wake up some some proving machine um, infrastructure every three hours, read the latest block header, uh, feed it into this uh, VDU. VDU is the name of this VDF. And uh, a number of minutes uh, after that, uh, sort of the output will be 
um, posted along with a um, along with the proof that the output is correct for the block header. Um, the target uh, delay corresponds to something like uh, three and a half minutes of delay based on you know estimates of what the fastest computers can do these days. It uses a state of two variables, um, each one of them 128 bit uh, prime, actually 126 bit prime, I believe. Um, so it uses a state size of two, and the length of the computation is 10 times 2 to the 25. So 2 to the 25 is, uh, what is it, 32 million 30 times 10. Million. Yeah. Right, so roughly uh, 0.3 billion iterations. Ah, and then here is Hi. Tom. Okay. I'm sorry. Tom, do you want to take it from here and explain? Uh, uh, Just run the VDF, you know, it takes some time until he... Yeah, yeah exactly. We had a VDF to, for, uh, to do the 23 to, to connect. Um, <laughs> okay, so go ahead. <laughs> what were you talking about? Oh, there's the thing, uh, you know, we, we do Starks and there's the okay, thing okay. called the VDF. Um, so maybe j just to um, to add on what Kinneret said, um, and I hope I, I won't be redundant because I didn't hear uh, everything, but um, the idea is to, to, to make it as simple as, as possible at, at, at first. And for that, what we do is, is we, we just take um, a constant interval of blocks. Let's say, I don't know if you want to do it uh, uh, every one hour. So it's uh, approximately 250 blocks. So our service tech takes each, two, each block, which is a uh, modulo 200, 250 is zero and use it as the seed for the VDF, computes the VDF and then sends it back to the contract that uh, Kinera just uh, showed you, um, and then you have a very easy and, and, and uh, reliable interface for uh, uh, everyone at first to um, uh, try and um, build on top of it or experiment with it, uh, knowing exactly which uh, blocks will be um, the seed for the next randomness. Um, so this is basically it. Um, maybe just explaining a little bit on, on what VDF, what exactly delay function we're using. So as, as Elliot mentioned, one way to um, to to make it harder uh, uh, to parallelize the, the computation is to use a state which is larger than one. So we're using a, a state uh, two, um, uh, 225 bit field. Um, in, Ariel asked okay. uh, the number of constants, for example, that we were using. So uh, we have uh, um, 10 times 256 uh, constants for each state. So it's, uh, and, and this is the, 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 the interval that we're going through. Um, What's play by 10? Yes. Oh, um, sorry. And we hope it will be, I mean, it will probably be uh, uh, out on ROPS the next week, so people will be able to, to look at it, and, and shortly after it will be on mainnet um, to provide a real uh, randomness, and, and we're very excited to, to see uh, what will be uh, the feedback, what what um, what things can be possible, people will be able to build on top of that, and um, how uh, this kind of service can be uh, made better in the future. Okay, so there's one uh, question here I see. Uh, Chloe, uh, the dev, is asking, would um, the data availability be secure with high gas costs? For example, would it matter if the network was congested? Is the gas price calculated based on estimated costs for the next block, or is it constant? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, it's a hot topic. Um, in the last uh, few weeks. So the input to the delay function, of course, is just uh, um, is derived from the block hash. So, so this is on chain. And then uh, what needs to be sent on chain after the computation is the proof. This is the, the, gas, uh, the gas consuming uh, transaction, which is uh, around 2 million gas, as Ellie said. So we are Currently, we're uh, using a quite simple algorithm, but 
it, it does take into account the um, the network uh, congestion and, and, and the gas cost, which is uh, currently will allow um, including the transaction in the in the next maximum uh, five minutes. Is what we hope. Any other okay. questions? So um, I, I think we should wrap up because um, uh, we, we're already taking um, you know an hour and a half. Um, I, I want to thank first of all. So okay, I want to thank uh, uh, Kineret and Tom. I want to thank uh, Joe Bono and Justin Drake uh, for uh, participating in this experimental. It's the first time that at least uh, I am on Crowdcast and inviting others and. Um, um, you know, if you have any thoughts on that, uh, you can either share it by, by mail or you can share it there. Uh, I don't know. I, th I seem to enjoy it. At least I can, you know, I speak less. That's good. <laughs> and uh, so we'll try to do more of that in the future. Um, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, next time we'll talk about uh, open source code for very efficient provers and verifiers, but we'll talk not so much about the code, more about the you know, sort of the, the math and optimizations behind that. And we'll announce it. That will be in roughly uh, two weeks' time. So uh, thank you very much once again. Um, and uh, hope to see you again. Bye.